In this video, I'm going to attempt to beat Baldur's Gate 3's hardest difficulty without leveling up. This presents a lot of different challenges. I barely have enough health to survive a slip and fall in Greece. My spellcasting can, at best, be described as a two-pump chunk, and it'll just keep getting worse and worse as I progress through the game. I decided to make my main character a wizard so I can learn a ton of spells and be prepared for any situation, and I chose Githyanki as my race so I can give myself proficiency in all charisma skills every day and talk my way out of bad situations that would have otherwise left me dead on the ground. Plus, I'm pretty sure the Spectral Mage Hand is going to come in handy at some point. Also, this video is not going to be about skipping the game. There will be parts where I avoid fights, but in general, I'm not planning on trying to just skip past all the content to technically beat the game. I want to actually play and beat the game, although you should definitely expect to see some ridiculous or cheesy strategies along the way. I know this might sound dumb, but I decided to keep my intelligence as low as possible so I could get points into as many other attributes as I could. This will make me extremely weak early on. I'm barely smart enough to remember one spell at a time. But don't worry, I have a plan. On the prologue ship, I'm going to grab everything that isn't nailed down. I'll need as many supplies as possible if I want a chance at beating the game at level 1. I used a little glitch I discovered to teleport Lazel straight to the transponder by summoning a mage hand in the control room, and I picked up all the nautiloid tanks, caustic bulbs, and void bulbs before having Lazel hit the transponder and send us into Act 1. I sent the heavy supplies to camp and headed out to recruit my party. Shadowheart joined the party, and since I don't need experience for killing them, I decided to sneak past the intellect of ours and probably got the luckiest stealth rolls of my life before jumping to safety. My second party member is Gale, and I talked some tieflings into leaving so I could recruit Lazel. Except I had an oops moment and freed Lazel before they walked away, and they attacked so I had to take them out. In this extremely easy fight, Shadowheart was almost killed, which doesn't set the best tone for my adventure, but no sense worrying about that now, because my full party has been assembled. But just to show how quickly things have escalated, this enemy bugbear has five times the health that my wizard has, and definitely has enough damage to drop me in a single hit. Thankfully, this fight has a lot of soldiers from the Druid Grove helping out, and we finished it up without too much trouble. I'm extremely interested in picking up explosive like these oil barrels, because it'll give me a massive damage boost in difficult fights, although I need to use them sparingly or I'll run out in no time. I had my cat familiar move an oil barrel into position to ambush these three true souls. Two of them died instantly, but the third took Gale down before I was able to finish her off. But I got what I wanted, which is this Mind Flayer Parasite that I will save for later. Between my charisma and my Githyanki ability giving me proficiency in charisma abilities each day, I'm getting plus five to my persuasion checks, and my friend's cantrip gives me advantage on the roll, so I was able to talk my way out of the goblin ambush easily. There might not be a reason to fight the goblins, but these ogres are a different story. I desperately need an item they have, and this wheelbarrow is going to help me get it. I moved the wheelbarrow over to the corner as well as a couple of chests, and made a cage for the ogres. Then I used Minor Illusion to lure the three of them into the corner, and had Lazel move in while the game was in turn-based mode to lock them in with the wheelbarrow. The ogres are now completely trapped, so as long as I don't give them clear line of sight to throw a rock or spell at me, I can take them all out without taking a single hit. The reason I needed to kill them is to get the headband of intellect for my wizard, bringing my intelligence from 8 straight up to 17. Now that my wizard actually has some intelligence, I can equip more spells at a time, so I used Featherfall to sneak into the goblin camp and did some business with the goblin merchant so I could get the returning pike. Back in the Druid Grove, I also bought the Ring of Flinging so that I can make a throwing build for Lazel. Gale started asking me for magic items, which this is not really that logical, but I just didn't want to deal with it, so I replaced him with Asterion. I had Asterion respec as a bard so that I can get bardic inspiration as well as have an additional mage hand and minor illusion when I need it. Minor illusion has been such a useful spell. Uh, I was able to use it to steal pretty much every single smoke powder barrel that the Senderim had. Um, they did know that I was stealing somehow almost immediately, but I was able to fast travel before they found me and make a quick getaway. I also can use Minor Illusion to set up really favorable combat situations by getting all the enemies to group up in one spot and then putting the game into turn-based mode and setting up a giant explosion to take them out 
all in one go. I had Lazelle throw two oil barrels down on the ground in between all the enemies, and then had Asterion toss a firebolt in to explode them all at once. But even with such a great start to combat, I had to take out the remaining two ancient mud methods, and it was still pretty challenging because I don't have that high of a chance to hit. I don't have very much health. I can't take very much before my characters go down. Thankfully, the returning pike can do damage uh, from being thrown from high ground, so that helps quite a bit. And we were able to get a Asterion up before he bled to death, so I didn't need to use a revivify scroll. I was here in the first place to loot these sparkle hands so I can have lightning damage get added to Lazel's throwing build. And we went down for our first long rest of the run. Asterion tried to suck me dry while I was sleeping Sleeping, but that helps quite a bit because now I have access to his vampire abilities. Back at the Goblin Merchant, I grabbed the Gloves of Archery so that I could have a little bit more consistent damage coming from my wizard because I'm just going to use my dexterity and ranged attacks for the majority of my damage. Inside the Goblin Camp, there are three enemies that have Illithid Parasites, and I want to get all of them because they definitely have a lot of power that's going to help me later on in this run. I talked my way in so I could get set up as favorably as possible before declaring war on the goblin camp. I sent Lazelle up to the high ground and had her run over and pick up this gilded chest, which I promptly sent over to my wizard so they could set it up at the bottom of the ladder, making it inaccessible to be climbed. The game kind of actually glitched out and it made the chest turn invisible, but it is still there. You can't get to the ladder. I grouped up all the goblins underneath the chandelier by using minor illusion so that Lazelle would be able to break the chandelier and do a massive amount of damage to start the fight. I had her fire her longbow at it and took the game out of turn-based mode so it would fall and it did so much damage. It actually butchered them. Now that I'm up at high ground and there's not very many goblins left, it's not going to be hard at all to take the rest of them out by throwing my pike down at them. Especially since these pike throws do an insane amount of damage from high ground because they get their base damage, they get falling damage from up high, and they have lightning damage procs coming in from my glove. In the next fight, there were quite a bit more goblins, but I put a chest at the top of every ladder on the rafters in this room, so none of them could climb up to me, and they occasionally got line of sight to land an attack on me, but for the most part, they weren't able to hit me, and I was just dropping bombs down on them until the fight was over. Drawer Ragslin even made the mistake of standing too close to the spider pit, and the falling pike managed to knock him back just a little bit down into the bottom, killing him with fall damage. My final target was Minthara, and I wanted to knock her into the pit and only realized later that that would have been terrible because I wouldn't have been able to loot the illithid parasite that I was here for. So thankfully she didn't fall in and we started firing at her from high ground, did a ton of damage, and I brought my other party members into the fight to finish her off. I looted the Mind Flayer Parasite and that brings my total up to four. I also raided the entire stash of fire wine barrels and smoke powder barrels that the goblins had, so I'll have those for later. I started heading down to Auntie Ethel's house because there's two items that I'm going to need to get from the hag. Thankfully, I succeeded on a check that revealed the whole area to be a swamp before talking to Auntie Ethel, so I was able to lure these red caps all into an explosive barrel ambush. The initial blast killed two out of the four of them, and that's actually a good thing. It means that I'm not overusing my explosive barrels, because I really want them to last as long as possible because enemies are getting more and more health, which makes it require more and more explosive to take them out. I finished off the final red cap with Asterion's vampire bite and we headed over to talk to Auntie Ethel. Ritual spells are spells that you can cast without using a spell slot when you're out of combat. So I used Longstrider on all of my party members and I also used Jump on my party members so we would be able to sneak past all of Auntie Ethel's masked slaves. Then we used Featherfall to jump all the way down to the heart of the hag's lair. I had Shadowheart cast Sanctuary on my wizard so that she would be safe against most types of attacks and then I just had my wizard walk right up to start talking to the hag. She wasn't very happy about the fact that I was in the heart of her lair and she summoned all of the reinforcements that I had snuck past to aid her in the fight. At this point, you might be thinking, Fracture, you messed up. You should have taken them out before going down there because then she wouldn't have anything to summon to help her. However, 
I wanted her to summon them because I didn't want her to use Hag's trickery and make a bunch of copies of herself. I need to know which one is the real Hag so I can take her down in a single turn. I snuck Lazelle past the fight and sent her into the mushroom circle so that I could have her return to camp and grab my fire wine barrels and nautiloid tanks. Then after shuffling those across a couple party members inventories, I got them over to my wizard and I set up a massive explosive trap all around the hag. There's four fire wine barrels and four nautiloid tanks. Then I just had Asterion come in with a firebolt and I blew the hag up, dropping her down to 15 HP. She did receive a heal from one of her mask slaves, but she was below 30 HP when her turn came, which ended the combat and allowed me to extort her for a little bit of her hair. This gives me a permanent plus one bonus to a stat, and I chose strength so that I can have Lazelle's throwing build be as powerful as possible. It was kind of annoying though, I had to fight all of her mask slaves after she left. The first one got knocked back by a pike throw right off the edge, instantly killing it. The second one was shoved off the edge by a shadow heart, instantly killing it. The third one shoved off the edge by shadow heart, instantly killing it. And the fourth one shoved straight off the edge by shadow heart, instantly killing it. We took some damage while we were trying to get it all set up, but nobody died so I didn't waste any revivify scrolls. And I got the bitter divorce wand, which allows me to bring back to life Connor, which is Marina's dead husband. And now I have a zombie friend that I can summon on demand to help me in the future. It's time for me to make my way to the Underdark, so I headed down through the well before casting Jump and Featherfall on myself and flipping the game into turn-based mode, so I was able to sneak past all of the enemies down here that really there's no upside to me fighting them. I don't think they have any loot that I need, and I don't need experience because I'm not leveling up. I kind of risked it to see whether or not the enemy would turn and look at me, and thankfully it just kept staring at the wall, so I was able to sneak past without fighting anybody. I left my party member behind so it would be a little bit easier for me to do the stealth part and I jumped down into the hole so I could get into the underdark and find a waypoint and get my party members to catch up. I headed straight to the mushroom village because there's two merchants in there that have a lot of supplies that I'm going to need. I was able to succeed on an insight check that was an extremely low difficulty class so I didn't have to do anything difficult to get access to the camp. And I found a waypoint so now everybody can catch up. Okay, I did a massive amount of pickpocketing in the mushroom camp, and if you need a pickpocketing guide, this is a really good one. But um, I would, after I was done pickpocketing, I went down for a long rest, and I respect Lazel to Barbarian so that I can get a little bit more damage out of those thrown pike attacks. I also had Lazel eat Auntie Ethel's hair, so she has 18 strength. Over at the wizard's tower in the Underdark, I was looting the whole thing just to get as many supplies as I could, but really the main thing that I came to the wizard tower for was going to be the chest of the mundane, which has a bunch of magic items in it, but really the important thing about it is that I can store anything inside of it and it changes those items into something that has a much lower weight, basically a bag of holding. I decided to use my first Illithid worm on my wizard to make it so that my first ability check against any target has a bonus equal to my proficiency bonus, which isn't ever going to go up because I'm not leveling, but it's at least a plus two to every ability check. I talked my way out of the ambush down at the lake, because again, there's really no upside to me fighting, especially at a disadvantage, so I always want to have the best possible chance that I can have to take them out. I did decide to kill all of these guys, uh, which probably wasn't the best idea. It was just a waste of a fire wine barrel because I just exploded them off the side. I think I just wanted to kill them. So I put the game into turn maze mode and exploded the fire wine to knock two of them straight off. I tried to shove the third one off the edge, failed, but I just took the game out of turn based mode and they weren't mad. So I went for another quick shove and managed to get that one as well. And the final enemy is the only one that I actually got to loot. Um, I shoved it off the edge and finished him off so that I could loot his body. Thankfully, there was a reward for taking all of them out. I got access to a treasure room that the mushroom people had, so I looted all of that before moving on with my adventure. I went on a little boat ride because I actually have not played past this part on the game on any of my other save files, so everything from here on is just me winging it. And I came to this roadblock where there was a cave-in that I could have blown up with any number of explosive barrels. I probably could have gotten up high and thrown things down on it as well, but I decided to just leave. I didn't feel like dealing with it, so 
I just headed out and we're going to go the Gith Yankee way instead and head to the Gith Yankee crash. We talked our way out of the fight here and a lot of the rest of this video, I'm going to be catering towards Lazel and doing what Lazel wants to do. There's going to be a couple exceptions, but we moved on and completely ignored the warning that said it would be bitterly difficult. At the crash, the Gith Yankee were on high alert and I decided that a stealthy approach was probably going to be my best bet here. So I headed through a broken window and a kobold just came running out the door at me and I just panicked when I saw the sight line and jumped back out, but he falls asleep right away. So there wasn't any cause for concern, but I didn't know that, so I took off running. I know this is going to sound weird, but playing through the game for my first time at level one was actually kind of cool because I didn't have to worry about gaining experience. So I got to actually play it the way that I wanted to. I've always really enjoyed using stealth to get past obstacles, but the feeling of leaving experience behind just normally makes me just feel sick to my stomach. But this challenge gave me the freedom to do whatever I wanted. Within the artifact of feeling stirs uncertainty. Your curiosity is getting the better of you. Stay away from the Githyanki. Well, I've already made the decision to just do whatever Lazel wants within limits, and I'm just going to ignore the warning and go in. But I am going to maybe sneak past as many as I can to see if I can avoid any conversations that would set me off on the wrong foot. I used my dear friend Minor Illusion to lure all the Gith Yankee up to the top, and I switched the game over to turn-based mode so I could sneak past all of them without the need to have any kind of conversation. I don't know how the conversation would have gone, but I don't need to know because I got all the way past them, opened the door, moved through, and shut it behind me once me and Lazelle had both gotten in. Once inside, nobody seemed to care that we were in there, and we even found a waypoint so I can bring my party members in later if I want to. And we found the infirmary, and that's where the device is that Lazelle's looking for that's supposed to be able to cleanse her of her illithid worm. There were also a bunch of Mind Flayer parasite specimens in this room, so I picked up all three of them so I will be able to evolve my characters later as needed. My time has come. I gave Lazel the go-ahead and she hopped into the device to get her illithid parasite cleansed. It was looking pretty questionable though, so I decided to go for a wisdom check to try and figure out more about the device, but I was really worried I was going to fail it. So I had my party members come in because Shadowheart can cast Guidance and Asterion can use Bardic Inspiration, so I'll have better dice rolls. I really don't want Lazel to die, especially since she's the one that ate Auntie Ethel's hair and I can't get that back. The wisdom check necessary to succeed was 21, which it's a good thing I still had my bliss spores from the mushroom colony when I helped them because I barely was able to get a 22 and pass the check. I discovered that the device was going to kill Lazelle, so I decided to do a persuasion check to tell her exactly that, and it was also a 21 difficulty check, so I used my friend's cantrip on her to give myself the best chance of succeeding on that, and I got a 24. What? I will not be gay. It looks like we need to go talk to whoever's in charge, so I tried to talk my way in, but they wanted me to hand over the artifact, which seems like a bad idea, so I decided to go for a deception check, and I used friends to get advantage on it, and I rolled a 3 and a 2. But with all the bonuses that I have, that actually managed to pass. There's a force field blocking my path to the person who's in charge, and it needs some sort of item, so I assumed that it was probably in the pocket of the person I just talked to, and the check was very easy to pull it out. After letting them search around for a little while, I came back in and I put the shard into the barrier disruptor to lower the force field so that I could head back and talk to the Gith Yankee Inquisitor. I decided to split my party up into two groups here, the Gith Yankee and then Asterian and Shadowheart on their own I left behind. And I sent Asterian back to camp with the chest of the mundane and I put every single explosive barrel that I had collected for the entire game into it and it weighs basically nothing when they're inside the chest of the mundane. So I can literally bring every single explosive with me and have them available at a moment's notice. During the conversation, I went full people pleaser with Blazel, trying to make sure that she approved of all the decisions that I was making. Even though it all felt really questionable, it didn't feel like I was making the right decisions, but I already had decided I wanted to see Blazel's story unfold. The Gith Yankee Queen asked us to go inside of the artifact and destroy the dream visitor that we've been having. This is where I 
drew the line, I did not want to destroy the Dream Visitor because it seems like they are the only thing keeping us from turning into a Mind Flayer, so I didn't want to risk it. I assume the game wouldn't have just ended or anything, but I went back to Lazelle and I told her that she was being lied to, and she wanted me to open my mind and show her the memories, so I did, and she seemed to like that, even though she also didn't seem to like the decisions that I had made. But it said Lazelle approves, so I'm gonna call that a win. The Dream Visitor told me that as soon as we got back to the real world, we were going to be attacked and they were going to try to kill us. So I did everything that I could to be prepared for that fight. And everything that I could was pretty much just casting Sanctuary on Asterion and making sure that all of the explosive barrels were out of the chest so that I would have easy access to them and hopefully Asterion won't get killed since enemies won't be able to directly target him. This is by far going to be the hardest fight of this video. The enemies that I'm up against are on so much of a different level than we are. They can kill us in pretty much one hit unless they miss or we save against their spells and they have so much health it would take way too long to kill them using conventional means and this is why we have collected so many explosives throughout the run. I put an oil barrel on the ground and threw my boots at it to break it then I pulled a candle out of my inventory and put it onto the oil to light it all on fire and I'm going to use this flaming surface to set up an insta kill on three enemies at once. I took out some of the void bulbs that I collected on the prologue ship and I put them on the ground and then moved them into the fire surface so they would manually detonate and pull the enemies together but I didn't quite position it correctly on the first try and I didn't get one of them in the back so I had to use a second void bulb and pull them all together and this time it was perfect everybody was nice and tightly grouped now what I need to do is I need to set up a bunch of explosive barrels so I put a chest down on the ground as like a staging area basically and I moved a bottle of water into the fire to put put some of the fire out so I'd have a safe place to put the barrels down. And then I just slowly moved all eight of the smoke powder barrels that I had onto the enemies so that it would be a massive detonation when I finally was ready. And hopefully I would be far enough away to not explode. With all the smoke powder barrels set up, I jumped Lazelle over to safety and then switched to my wizard. And I had my wizard shoot an arrow of fire to detonate the explosives. My wizard actually got downed by psionic revenge, but it's okay because I was only down, not completely dead. I took Asterion and threw all the barrels back into the chest of the mundane so he could move again, and then used healing word to get my wizard back on her feet. Then I fired off pretty much every single powerful spell that I was getting access to due to the equipment that my characters were wearing, and tried to finish the fight up as quickly as possible. Because even though there's only two enemies left, that's still enough enemies to completely wipe us out if I'm not careful. I also had a kind of funny moment where I used Healing Word on Shadowheart and it actually restored negative one hit points and so Shadowheart said that it said that she was dead and at zero hit points but she was definitely on her feet and able to move and there was absolutely nothing wrong with her so it was really really weird. The game was confused. I had Asterion use Thunder Wave to finish off an enemy and then come in with Scorching Ray to take care of the next one. And I got to looting all the corpses, but the problem now is that we are stuck inside the heart of the Githyanki Kresh. So I need to try and either sneak out or find an alternate way out. And as I was looting, these statues started glowing, so I knew there was some kind of puzzle to it. After solving the puzzle, a secret passageway opened and I decided that I had to check it out because hopefully there'd be a secondary way out of here that doesn't involve me fighting my way through way too many Githyanki. The secret passageway led straight to a mace that was named the Blood of Lathander, and I really wanted it, but it said that it was a bad idea to take it, so I used Featherfall on my party in case the floor dropped out or something like that, and my party members, except for Asterion, didn't really like that I was taking it, and it totally set off this trap that is going to absolutely butcher everybody in the crash unless I either disarm it or manage to escape, then at least I can survive. My characters don't do enough damage to be able to destroy any of the things that are arming this device. And this mace is so good, it's definitely going to be useful. If anything, just for the level six spell that it lets me cast, I was able to cast leap on myself to jump out of the trap that I was in. I could just barely get up onto the ledge. I tried to shoot and do damage to the machine to see if it was even possible. And there's there's no way, my characters are not going to be able to do enough damage 
damage, so we took off running. I managed to get all of my characters to safety right in time for the entire Gith Yankee crash to explode. I told Lazelle that we should have been more careful. Yes, we, but mostly you. It says Lazelle approves, so I'm gonna call this one a win. There were some undead enemies blocking my path, so I lured them out of position with minor illusion and had them get into combat with just my wizard before having the rest of my party sneak past and we managed to get to the door leading to the shadow cursed lands, which is going to be bitterly difficult for a party of my level. I'm heading into the shadow cursed lands where you need a source of light to be safe from the shadows and Karnas, the weird spider drow mix thing, has as a special moon lantern. Although Shadowheart can go out a little bit on her own as long as it's not too dark and she doesn't actually need a torch. And that came in handy when I came across an ambush and thankfully one of my party members succeeded on the perception check. I sent Shadowheart around on her own in order to get behind the ambush and I set up a smoke powder barrel behind the two that were on the really high ground and blew them straight off the edge to start the fight. This inflicted the surprised condition onto the ambushers so they didn't get to take a turn in combat and we completely wiped them out without them having a chance to fight back at all. The majority of my best spells are actually coming from items that I have equipped at this point, but I do try to use them sparingly so I don't have to long rest too often. I reached Moonrise Tower and was given my own Moon Lantern, and I headed to the Mausoleum so I could learn the secret to Kethric Thorm's immortality. Inside the Mausoleum, I found three reconstituted skeleton soldiers and I prepared for a fight. It turns out they were on my side, but the shadows that came to attack us were certainly not. And the shadows were a lot stronger than my allies were. I had Shadowheart cast Sanctuary on herself so I could just observe the fight and see what happened, and I just waited until the little portals had spit out all the skeletons they possibly could, which left me with like 11 skeleton soldiers that I needed to find a way to take care of. By the way, in Act 1 I put a pretty heavy emphasis on Lazelle and trying to make sure that I explored her story, and in Act 2 I'm going to put an emphasis on Shadowheart. For the most part, I want to let her story play out the way that she wants it to. Back to the fight, I made a wall of chests in front of this door, and I clicked on the door after to make sure that it was inaccessible from this side. So, all of the skeletons started to approach, but they're not going to be able to touch the door, and I didn't leave enough room for them to jump in between the door and the chests. So the only way for them to get to me would be to destroy or move the chests, but they can't move chests, so they just stood there attacking them, and on my turn, I just opened the door, took some shots, and then shut the door again, so they couldn't do anything to fight back at all. This would have taken a really long time, but the blood of Lathander Mace lets me cast Sunbeam, and I just nuked eight of them in a single blast. They have an ability that returns radiant damage, but the blood of Lathander can bring me back to life once, so killing all of them downed me and then instantly brought me back, so I was able to finish the fight out without it taking too long. Moments later, I found myself in the exact same situation. It was literally the same fight in a different room, but I I'd already used my sunbeam spell and I didn't want to have to fight that many skeletons again, so I decided to take out the umbral tremors before they got a chance to spawn too many skeletons. To take out the first one, I used the wand second marriage to summon a zombie Connor and I ran it at the umbral tremor and attacked it. Then I just summoned a new one from outside of the combat range and I told it once again to attack it. As long as it has the order to attack before it gets into combat, it'll finish running forward and make its hit, so I just kept summoning Connor over and over again till it was dead. Then I sent Astarian to do Scorching Ray on one of them, and it didn't put him into combat like I was expecting, so I just cast Firebolt over and over again to finish that one off. I used the same strategy to fire my crossbow at the one in the middle of the room, and a couple skeletons did end up getting spawned, but they weren't too hard to take out, wrapping the fight up nice and easy. I did a little exploring, and I came across a cloaker that was planning to ambush me, but succeeded at the perception check so I didn't get absolutely slaughtered. I cast Sanctuary on my wizard and I put my other characters up at high ground to shoot down at it, but the cloaker summoned a bunch of phantasms, which should have butchered me. I should have died in this fight, but for whatever reason, the phantasms decided to fly back down to my wizard, who can't be targeted because of the Sanctuary spell, and they all just turned and stared at my wizard for the entirety of the fight, while my other characters up on the ledge were just shooting and throwing spears down until we had killed the cloaker. I do not know why the AI decided to do this. If you know, tell me because 
I was pretty baffled by this one. Sometimes I come across things when I'm trying to cheese games that I don't know why it happens, but it just does. And this is one of them. I listened to some of the comments you all left me and I went and got the Misty Step boots from Nier and I went and I got the Spectator in the bottle over in the Zentarim missing shipment. Regrettably, I forgot to go grab the Rune Powder barrel and I also didn't go get the gem that works for the Necromancy of Thay book, which I feel like that one might come back to bite me in Act 3, but we'll see. Since I already had Nier's head, I went and brought it to the Mushroom people and I got a amulet that lets me increase my persuasion, so that's definitely going to help me out when I need to make difficult dialogue checks. I also spent a little while upgrading my gear. I went to the merchants and I bought all of the most expensive and best items that I could find. Then I went down to the gold that they have in their inventory and I split it by holding left shift and just dragging my mouse and I, I just split it into a whole bunch of little bite-sized pieces so I could come back with a starion and pickpocket all of the little tiny piles of gold without any trouble. First I used fog cloud to make it so the NPCs couldn't see the merchant that I was pickpocketing and I put it into turn-based mode so the cloud wouldn't go away and then I just stole every single pile of gold back. It was really tedious to split the stacks that small but I don't, I can't get my stats that much higher, so I can't really risk getting caught every single time I want to go do some pickpocketing. So I put in the effort, I split all the stacks up, and I stole every single one of them back to back. And pretty much anytime you see gear that I'm using that I got from a merchant, you should just assume I did this. I also start resetting a lot of the spells that I'm getting from items by traveling to Act 1 and then back to Act 2, and it just resets the spell completely. So... If I use Fog Cloud to steal from a merchant and then travel to Act 1 and back to Act 2, I can use it again without needing to do a long rest. I decided to check out the House of Healing before getting back to the Gauntlet of Shar, so I jumped my main character down to talk to the surgeon. As a wizard, I had advantage on a persuasion check to convince the surgeon to volunteer to let his surgery assistants practice on him. And I managed to roll a 16, which got over the check by 4. So the surgeon laid down on the table, and just let his surgery assistants kill him. So I didn't have to fight him, which was actually great because he had so much health. And I'm sure I could have found a way to kill him, but this video is to see if you can beat the game at level one. And if my level one character can convince somebody to kill themselves, so be it. I'm happy with this outcome. I had to complete the Gauntlet of Shar. The first part was just a stealth check challenge. It was pretty easy, just snuck past a couple of shadows using turn-based mode. The combat challenge was a different story. There's a bunch of mirror images of my characters, and I'm only supposed to attack the mirror image of the character that I'm using, so Shadowheart is only supposed to attack mirror Shadowheart. I assumed that that meant they would apply the same treatment to me, which was very much not true. But they are weak to radiant damage, so I decided to have Shadowheart try to use Sunbeam to one-shot her mere self, which she saved against the spell, so that didn't work out, and it ended very, very quickly after that. So I loaded up a previous save and stripped Shadowheart down so that she wasn't wearing any gear at all. I also encumbered her. I didn't know if this was going to work or not, and it didn't work, but I decided to give it a try. I sent her in alone this time, so it was only her inside of the challenge, and after I started the challenge, I put all of her gear back on and got rid of all the chests that were encumbering me, and prepared to fight the Shadowheart mirror image. This time it was just a one-on-one -on -one fight, and the mirror Shadowheart didn't have any items equipped whatsoever, which made her a lot weaker, and she also didn't save against the spell, so I one-shot her with Sunbeam. She dropped a pretty cool item, I wonder if I could have gotten more items if I had fought the rest of them, but it's no big deal, I'm gonna move on because that makes it easier. I reset all of my cooldowns by traveling to Act 1 and back to Act 2 before moving to the next challenge, which was the Leap of Faith. Since it was called the Leap of Faith, I used jump on Shadowheart, and then I just jumped her past all of- I, I guess there's a path or something maybe? I don't, I don't really know. I jumped over every single gap, and I was done with this one pretty quick. Then I headed to the Silent Library, where there is an orb in the middle of the room that silences everybody, and that's actually not in my favor, because my characters are kind of relying on the high-level spells they get from their gear. So I took down the Librarian from outside of the zone, so I could avoid getting into combat. I just took shots at it from super far away until it was gone, and that got rid of the silence aura. I used Minor Illusion to group up as many of them as I could. A lot of them didn't respond to Minor Illusion at all, only three of them moved, but that did make it so that I was able to get a Sunbeam hit on four of them. 
and that did pretty massive amounts of damage, but it did also kill Shadowheart because of the Radiant Retort ability they have, and then her mace brought her back to life. So that ability has already been used. The rest of this fight got messy. It got really messy. I had Lazelle take one out with a spear throw, and then I had Astarian fire Scorching Ray to take another. So this fight's off to a really good start. Uh, four of my characters all alive against just two enemies, but that isn't going to matter when I'm level one because they do so much more damage than I have as my available health pool. All three of Lazelle's party members got taken down in a very short amount of time, leaving it up to her to take on the rest of the fight. I decided it would be in my best interest to mostly run away and get a long range spear throw to try and take out one of them. And I got so close, but he just needed a little bit more damage. So I ran away and left my down party members behind and these skeletons were not messing around. They were just finishing them off left and right. But that actually is kind of a good thing because if they had gone for Lazelle, I probably would would have lost. I would have needed to load a previous save. Lazelle was in rage, so she only took half damage from the attack, and she was able to finish off the low health skeleton. Then I ran the rest of the way out so I could break line of sight, and the skeleton just went and finished off Astarian. I got a massive critical hit spear throw, but it wasn't enough damage to kill it, and as a result, the skeleton ran over and slaughtered my wizard as well. So all three party members are completely dead, but the skeleton skeleton is within range to die, so I decided not to risk it and I used End Rage so that I could cast spells again. And then Lazelle has a crossbow that's giving her magic missile, so I cast that to make sure that this thing was going to die and I would win the fight. Now I've got three dead party members and I didn't want to use Revivify scrolls. I cannot say Revivify. I just can't do it when I'm recording videos. Anyways, I travel to Act 1 and I travel back to act two and everybody's revived all their items are reset totally cheesy love it i got to go loot a little treasure room at the back of the library and i got a good armor set for shadow heart as well as a spear that said it was going to be useful for the storyline when i showed up to put all the umbral gems into the place that they belonged i found that i was missing one so i needed to keep exploring down here to figure out where that last gem was and unfortunately that last gem was being guarded by a base basically a small army that was in ambush position ready to kill me. I don't really have enough explosives at this point to just like keep fighting everything and blowing everything up and there are other strategies that I could use to try and cheese or clear this fight but it gave me the option to try to persuade him to kill all of his followers so I went with it and I managed to get it to succeed. So he commanded all his followers to kill each other. Then it gave me the option to try to convince him to kill his displacer beast. I went with the dialogue option and I failed it by two. So I decided to use a point of inspiration and I managed to get it to succeed on my second try. He also seemed really sad about killing his displacer and it, it made me feel sad. So I blurred out the footage. Then I had the final test and it gave me the option to try to convince him to kill himself and I really figured that this was going to be a hard check so I brought Astarian over and used Bardic Inspiration on my wizard to give me the best possible chance of succeeding on this check. I should have also used that mushroom amulet but uh, I forgot so I did rolled the dice and I managed to get a 23 and when it was all done I convinced this dude to kill all of them for me so I didn't have to do it and I consider that to be best case scenario. That silver tongue of yours is dangerous. I can't believe you actually pulled that off. Honestly, Shadowheart, I can't believe it either. We were finally at the entrance to Shadowfell, so we took the plunge to see what was laying in store for us. And we almost immediately came across Balthazar, who followed us in. I let Shadowheart take the lead in the conversation, and since I'm trying to make Act 2 about Shadowheart as much as possible, we're gonna have to fight this guy. About two seconds into the fight, I realized that this was not going to happen. I was definitely going to die on this attempt, and I was gonna have to load a previous save and figure out what I'm going to do about it because there are so many skeletons that he summons and they are spread out across the entire area. Even if it was just the skeletons and Balthazar wasn't fighting, I would still have trouble fighting them, especially if I fought fair. But I don't fight fair. I generally believe that there's always a way to cheese a fight, so it doesn't matter how outmatched it looks like I'm going to be. I just assume that I'm going to be able to figure out some way to deal with it. I had two major 
takeaways from my first attempt. The first is that there's a lot of skeletons and they're really spread out and that's a problem. And the second is that he has a potion of speed in his inventory and I need to make it so that it is not in his inventory. I noticed that I could move the piles of bones and that they seem to be spread out in the exact same amount that all the skeletons he summoned were spread out. So logically, it seemed like he probably is summoning every one of those skeletons from these bones. And if I can move them, I can put all of them over on the edge in the same spot. If this worked, I would have every single skeleton grouped up in a single location, and that would make it so, so much easier to deal with them. So I put them all on the ledge, trapped by two chests and a smoke powder barrel. Then I took Shadowheart out of stealth, and since I had picked his pocket earlier, he was ready to fight immediately without any conversation, and he summoned all of his skeletons right there, trapped on the ledge. Except that one pile of bones that was bugged and I couldn't move it earlier. So I had Shadowheart cast Firebolt and just exploded almost every single skeleton instantly. Two of the stronger, more healthy ones were still there, but I had my other party members come in with some attacks immediately, and we were able to finish them off before they had a chance to do anything in the fight. So we've dealt with every single skeleton but one because his bones were bugged. From this point on, we're going to have to deal with Balthazar's main attack, which is Cloud Kill, a massive damaging spell that took down my party members every single time he cast it in a single hit. I sent Shadowheart up and used Sunbeam to take out that last skeleton and do damage to Balthazar before throwing a health potion over at my wizard and not clicking correctly and not getting it. So that was frustrating. Balthazar ran over and used Cloud Kill on Shadowheart next, and she only survived because the Blood of Lathander Mace brought her back. And that can only happen once per fight. So that's been used up. Since I failed the health potion throw, I went ahead and used Healing Word to bring my wizard back to her feet. And then we started just launching attacks over at Balthazar as much as possible. And the rest of the fight is pretty much just going to be a battle of him slaughtering us in a single hit and me trying to get that person back up and then do damage as well. I also made a handful of mistakes where I grouped my party members too close to each other and he was able to get double kills, which was really, really not ideal. And I tried to avoid it after the first time it happened. But thankfully, Lazelle has mass healing word from one of her items. So she was able to get them both back up on their feet. And I was just dropping every Every single spell I could, and this guy would not lose concentration on Cloud Kill. Every single time I hit him, concentration saving throw successful. I thought I had my party members spread out enough, but he managed to hit them both with just the edge of the spell on either side. So I used Misty Step to teleport my wizard over to Shadowheart, and I just helped her to her feet. And then I had Shadowheart use her bonus action to heal Astarian, get him back to his feet, and we just were having such a time. It was very difficult to keep any anybody alive for any amount of time and he just would not lose concentration on this spell but finally after burning pretty much every spell slot using healing word as many times as I possibly could he lost concentration on cloud kill and died the same turn so there's that so now it's time for Shadowheart to talk to the Night Song. And Shadowheart is supposed to kill the Night Song. That's what Char wants her to do. But there's a persuasion check where I can try to get her to not do it. And I decided to throw everything that I had at this persuasion check. I was willing to use all four inspiration for it, but I actually got it on my first try, which was amazing because now Shadowheart can go down hopefully a path with more light in it rather than darkness. This ended up working out really well for me later in Act 2. In fact, I don't know if I would have been able to clear the final boss if I hadn't made this decision. I accidentally walked into an ambush where a bunch of Gith Yankee soldiers just kind of slaughtered me, so I reloaded to approach it a little bit more strategically, and I positioned my party members up on the roof. Then I had my wizard jump past where the ambush was to the waypoint, and I actually managed to get the ambush to spawn without attacking me or locking me into a conversation or anything. So I stacked up a bunch of explosive barrels and then used a series of minor illusion casts to get all of the Githyanki warriors to group up around my explosives. When I finally set the explosives off, I managed to kill everybody except for the boss lady, and she has a ton of health. I didn't even get put 
into combat when I exploded it, so she healed herself instantly, and I'm gonna have to take her on a different way. From up on the rooftop, I decided to use my second marriage wand to summon Connor the zombie to lure her a little bit closer to where my party was set up. It worked even better than expected because her Eldritch Blast has Repelling Blast, so she knocked Connor away and then moved forward to get closer again. So she was in range of all my party members and their bow, crossbow, hand crossbow, all the bow attacks. But she has 165 health and we do not have that high of a chance to hit. So just having a good ambush position isn't going to cut it for this fight. Except that it kind of is going to cut it for this fight because I had my party members walk far enough away that they were able to just flee and go back to camp. Then I had them leave camp and walk back up and take another shot. They instantly got to take their turn again, so I walked them away after they were all done shooting, and we went back to camp, brought them back into the fight, took another shot. I had an infinite turn exploit set up perfectly where we were able to take as many turns as we wanted in round one of combat, and it never ended, so it took an absolutely insane amount of time to finish her off, but we did take her out, and Lazel even got inspired for killing a boss in the Shadow Curse lands in a single round of combat. It's time to assault Kethric Thorm at Moonrise Tower, and I was able to recruit the level 8 druid Jahira to my side and control her as a companion, which is going to be really, really helpful. I also spent a little time buying everything that looked good from their merchant and then stealing all of my gold back, so I got access to Fireball as a level 3 spell. I walked into the fight, to see how it went, and I used a Mage Hand to shove one of their archers off the top and Lazel to shove another, and I had Jahira in panther form attack the third one. Things got off to a bad start almost immediately when I tried to cast Fireball and it got counterspelled, and the gap of magic ability that my enemies have compared to me is really starting to become noticeable. I tried using an Oil Barrel and a Fire Wine Barrel to start the fight off with an explosion on a bunch of the enemies that were grouped up, but it did not do enough damage to really be worthwhile, and most of the enemies were spread out so they didn't get hit. With Black Hole sucking all of my party members and my allies together, and then Hunger of Hadar doing tons of damage, it didn't go well. The fight went horribly. I was getting killed by reactions to my spell cast. I was getting destroyed in a single hit. I was- Jahira died. It was awful. The enemies seem way stronger than the, my allies that I have and sometimes can even do a sequence of attacks that is just one-shotting them. So this is going to be kind of a nightmare fight and I'm gonna need to find something that's gonna do some heavy lifting for me in this fight because I'm not gonna be able to do it myself. And Mei Chan won't do it either, which is why I went and found some wheelbarrows. They were in the gray graveyard, so I stacked them up and started moving them over to Moonrise Tower. I had to get a little crafty at one point and put them up on top of a little street light and then throw them over. Um, I had to actually throw them, like pick them up and throw them because it wasn't letting me move them through this area. But anyways, I finally got them there and I blocked the path to my allies with these two wheelbarrows so you couldn't walk past without jumping. I made a second wall of chests and this chandelier behind my allies and made sure that there was no way to get in without jumping there. Then I used my Githyanki ability to summon an invisible mage hand and put the game into turn-based mode. I flew my invisible mage hand towards the fight and used minor illusion to get the enemies that were in the back room to move a little bit closer before casting darkness to blind all eight of my allies in the fight. I started the fight by attacking with my mage hand and it grouped the two combats together so both rooms were all in a single fight. But if you look at the top you'll notice that my allies allies are not a part of this fight. Since my allies are all blinded by the darkness spell, they aren't a part of this combat yet. And I flew my mage hand back to make sure that it put my wizard into the combat so that the darkness spell timer wouldn't just go down. Since my wizard was in the fight but far enough away that she seemed inaccessible, the enemies all started moving towards the barrier that I had set up with the wheelbarrows, but they weren't jumping over it. So all I had to do was end turn enough times in a row to get all of the enemies from both rooms to group up against my wheelbarrows pretty tightly packed as well. Once I had everybody grouped up in one small area, I set up a bunch of smoke powder barrels. I had Astarian use Fireball to blow them all to hell.
A good start, but I'm not finished yet. I had Lazelle use Magic Missile in order to bait out the counter spell so that I would be able to use a more important ability with Jahira from up above, and I used Ice Storm on all of the rest of the enemies that were still alive down there, and pretty much killed off all of the big important enemies in a single go. Now I do have some regrets. If I had known that all of the Harpers were going to be so useless to me in the boss fight at the end of the tower, I wouldn't have put as many explosive barrels down and saved as many. I thought that they would be able to go all the way up with me, but they just all stopped after this room, and I only had one of them die during the fight, and that really feels like a wasted resource. I think if more of them had died, then it would have been more of a perfect fight, and maybe like f like two less smoke powder barrels could have been used. I had Jahira use her second Ice Storm spell slot on the enemy that was blocking the door that is leading up to Kethrick Thor and we took them out and we were ready to go to the boss fight. I saved the game because I was planning on having my first attempt just be a scouting mission to see what the fight was like. I tried to persuade Kethrick Thorm to redeem himself in hopes that I wouldn't have to do the fight and even though I succeeded on the check by a lot it didn't seem to make a difference and we were going to have to fight. Now I know that I've used explosive barrels to get through a lot of fights but there's something that you have to understand which is that there's not an unlimited amount of explosive barrels and I am starting to run low, so I can't just explode my way through every encounter. In fact, I've probably used too many as it is already, and I'm not going to have enough for Act 3. So I put my party members into sneak mode and sent them all out different directions so I could just see how the fight unfolds, hopefully getting my party members away far enough that they won't be discovered. Aelin got taken down almost immediately, but she has the Child of the Moon Maiden feature, which makes it so that she is immortal. She can't be permanently killed and always gets back up at the start of her turn. So my hope was that maybe there would be a way for me to use that. But my wizard got discovered and murdered, and that's when I noticed the door leading back down the tower. So I figured it was worth a shot. I jumped Shadowheart down to the door, and I went back down and left the fight. This is good news. It means there's room for exploiting. I had Astarian go next, and thankfully he takes half fall damage, so he was able to make it even though he only had 2 HP. Lazelle, on the other hand, only had 1 HP, but it was better to have her dead by the door than dead far away where I can't get to her. I had Shadowheart waiting and I used the help action to get Lazel back on her feet, but it brought Shadowheart into the fight, so I was hoping that I would be able to have enough time to escape back inside. They also finished off my wizard, so she's dead. I had Jahira sneaking around the outside of the tower, and I figured I would just put her out on one of the pedestals and just leave her for a while while I watch and see what happens with the fight. Lazel gets knocked back down by a spell from one of the Necromites, and they try to go for Shadowheart next, but Shadowheart's mace blinded them right as they got in range, so I think they weren't able to cast the spell. So I got Lazel back on her feet for a second time, and we both escaped through the door, but that's when something strange happened. Even though Shadowheart had escaped the fight, she technically remained in it and was in turn-based mode in combat even though the other two got taken out and the first time that she left she had been taken out and this was a godsend the fact that she is still in combat means that i can control her turn perfectly to be able to do hit and runs through the door I moved Jahira further away because she's not going to be necessary for this fight. I had Lazelle and Astarian both use Shove on Shadowheart so that they would join the fight as well, and all of them are now able to go out the door, take a shot at an enemy, and then before their turn is over, they can go back through the door to safety where the enemy can't get to them at all. Just gonna drop a reminder here that I warned you at the beginning of the video that if you don't like cheesy gameplay, this isn't the video for you. I had all of my enemies exactly where I wanted them. They were all within reach of my ranged attacks right outside the doorway. But there was something that was going to cause that to change, which was a little bit unfortunate and I needed to get ahead of it, which is that these Necromites just somehow magically knew that Jahira had gone all the way over to her tower. So I decided to move her towards the door in hopes that I could get her out, but kind of expecting that she would die. But at least she would die without luring all of the enemies away from our perfect positioning. The moment that I knew for sure she was dead was when I used all of her action points to end her right next to like a whole bunch of enemies, and only one of them was required. Kethrick Thorm just one-shot her, so unfortunately she's dead, and I don't
don't feel like that's my fault. They just magically knew. But if I'm gonna cheese the game, I guess they get to do it a little bit as well. It's only fair, right? We used some attacks to take out as many Necromites as we could. And actually, Aelin was getting back on her feet and shoving people off the tower, which was kind of hilarious. She was just working her way through them and getting taken down every time she was done going for a shove. But with enough Necromites gone, Aelin actually was finally able to fly over to the main fight and yeeted one of the primary like spellcaster enemies off the ledge before she got absolutely dunked on by Ketherick Thorm again. I decided to try to use a revivify scroll on my wizard because I noticed that they kind of liked hovering near her corpse sometimes and I thought okay well maybe if I just get everybody down here then the enemies will stay in range because sometimes they were outside of my attack range and that was frustrating. But trying to revive my wizard actually ended up making the game get like totally confused and it just froze up and combat wouldn't progress anymore. So I had to go back to the save file right before I brought my wizard downstairs and I, I let her just get killed again rather than bringing her to safety because it seemed like it was just breaking the combat. I wish I could say that my wizard's death was epic or something, but really my wizard just got absolutely annihilated in two hits, all of her health just gone. And of course Aelin gets taken down again, but she's got a little trick up her sleeve when she shoved the spider off the ledge, dealing 682 bludgeoning damage from falling. Even though she's only been taking bonus actions for the whole combat, she's actually been so clutch and so helpful. Ketherick Thorm can't be moved by anything, so you can't shove him off the tower, but literally everybody else was just getting shoved off constantly. And Aelin even managed to survive long enough, uh, all of the attacks missed, and she got a critical strike on her opportunity attack against Ketherick Thorm. I'd been experimenting with all sorts of different things, leaving some people outside the door, keeping everybody in the door, all so pretty much anything that I could think of. I was just trying all sorts of stuff to see what I could do. Um, but realistically, the way the fight was going to end was my characters were going to have to attack over and over and over again until we finally managed to get some hits because we only have like a 10 to 20% chance to hit on any given attack. So it was pretty awful. But we finally managed to get Ketherick Thorm down down below the health threshold where he runs like a coward from the might of our cheese. The game decided to cheese me back when it had the Harpers get mad at me for being in an unauthorized area in a tower that isn't theirs, but I got a nat 20 on the deception check, so I actually managed to get out of it. But man, that was pretty annoying that they were just willing to kill me because I was in a tower that doesn't belong to them. I went down for a much earned long rest, but then the games tried to cheese me again by using twice as many supplies as it should be using. I found these evidence chests that are invulnerable and I was able to pick them up. So I know for a fact that's going to come in handy at some point. And I found the hole where I can jump down to towards the Mind Flayer colony, but I forgot to use Featherfall. So there goes all the health from my long rest that I just did. So that's a bummer. And the game had one more cheese in mind for me because I found a boat that said that I wouldn't be able to return. So I clicked remain in Moonrise. I'm, I'm watching it right now as I do this voice audio remain in moonrise and the game takes me away from moonrise I don't know, I think the game was just freaking out because of the amount of cheesing that I had done and it had no idea what was going on. So I had to reboot it um, because it was doing all sorts of weird stuff. But at least I found Last Light Inn because now there's more merchants that I can buy slash steal things from, definitely steal. I picked up a cloak that lets me make fog clouds when disengaging that I will be shocked if I don't find a good way to use that. All my characters cheese me one last time by stepping on a bunch of blast mines, but I wasn't recording when it happened because I didn't expect it to happen. Um, but that's why their health is so low. So uh, just a wild sequence of me getting railed by the game after being super mean to the game. But we went into the Mind Flayer colony one step closer to the big boss fight of Act 2. But first, I'm going to need to get these Nautiloid tanks because I need more explosives. Fortunately for me, there was a reusable restoration station in the Mind Flayer colony, which gives me the perfect excuse to go all out with my spells on everything that's on board this ship. I was firing off sunbeams, shooting fireballs, just doing literally every single big spell that I had to absolutely slaughter 
anything that was on this ship. It was really fun to be able to use all of my spells with no worries whatsoever about being conservative, because I could always get them back from the restoration station. My only regret here is that when I got to the really big fight with all the enemies, I fired off all of my best spells right at the beginning, and I later put a bunch of chests in front of the door and grouped them all up, but I didn't have any good area of effect spells to use on them anymore. They were all used up. So I did throw some holy water to just kind of see what that did, um, which was damage. It did damage. But um, I had a thunder wave that most of them saved against, but I just pretty much played zombie apocalypse simulator for a while with my wall of chests and was just shooting all of the zombies in the head uh, until I finally managed to take all of them out. And it was pretty amusing, but it did take a little bit longer than I was hoping. It was finally time. So I headed down the elevator with just my wizard so I could go scout the fight and sent them in to see what was going on. I tried using Minor Illusion on Catherick Thorm and found that I could pull him out of position before the fight started. I also shuffled around in his pockets to see if he had any items he would use during the fight, but he just had a crumpled up note. So I stole it, um, but I don't think that's going to, you know, severely hinder him during the fight. Once I was ready to start the fight for real, I headed over to where Aelin was because she somehow managed to get herself captured again, which is kind of annoying because she's supposed to be so powerful and whatever. But uh, I noticed that the soul cage status effect could be removed with the help action. So I jumped over to her, I used the help action, and pretty much just got annihilated after that. I didn't actually see what hit me, but it looks like it was probably the Mind Flayer blasting uh, me in the background when it was hitting Aelin, but it takes me out with a giant blast, and I was just looking at Aelin's stats to see if she had all the same stuff that she had in the last fight, and she did. She fired off a pretty big Lunar Blessing to do some damage, but it didn't really end up mattering, and the Mind Flayer came over and just ate my brains, I guess, so my wizard was dead, like a turn and a half into the fight, all done. Really the joke's on him because my intelligence is eight. The only reason that I have more is because of the headband. So that brain is gonna be useless for him. At this point in the fight, I decided to just leave my character dead on the ground and see what happened. And Aelin just started shoving people off the edge. Occasionally she got an opportunity attack and I just left her alone for long enough and she took out all the intellect devourers and most of the necromites before getting into a repeating loop where she shoved the mind flare off the edge over and over again, but it just appeared back up next to her. Once the combat was in a repeating loop, I sent a Starion down with all of my Nautiloid tanks and two fire wine barrels because I'm going to try to blow up Kethric Thorm. Almost all of the explosives that I have that I'm using, I got on the ship right here, so I don't feel like it's a huge loss to have two fire, and fire wine barrels in the mix. I got spotted by the enemies, but it put me into the combat queue with my turn coming up first, even though some of the enemies kept moving and, and taking some actions. I don't really know what that was about. I actually had to save and reload the game in order to move any of the barrels, but I got all the explosives into position and I cast Firebolt. With Kethric Thorm at 6 health, I sent Lazelle into the fight because she has magic missile, so I can guarantee that he goes down by just applying uh, 2, I mean, I would have needed more than 2 to guarantee, but I, I trusted the dice. And that brought the fight into the next phase. And this is the phase that a lot of people were saying they didn't think I was going to be able to clear. And now that I've seen the fight, I completely understand why they would think that. Because quite frankly, I don't think I should have been able to clear it, but I managed to find the perfect cheese. Astarian got butchered almost immediately, and Lazelle wasn't going to last much longer either. I threw a caustic bulb at him, which ended up being a complete waste, completely not important at all. And the Mind Flayer flew up and extracted Lazelle's brain, and three of my party members are dead on the ground. Something that I've noticed as a person who likes to cheese games is that a lot of the time, you don't end up cheesing things the way you expected to. A lot of the time, you can't predict the way that you're going to cheese a fight at all. You just have to poke and prod until you brute force your way into beating the game. And that's what happened here, because that fire surface that was created when I exploded Catherick Thorm's human form isn't going to go away for the entire fight, and it just barely barely is counting as being underneath him, so he is in a fire surface. That means he's going to take 1d4 fire damage every single turn. 
as long as the fight keeps going. And since Aelin is immortal and can never actually be killed, the only way for this fight to end is for Kethric Thorm to die. I kind of wish this was the end of Act 2 because I feel like that was a huge climax moment in the video and people are just going to start clicking off right now, but I have to keep going until I get the achievement on Steam. So there are actually two more challenging fights that I need to get past before I've officially beaten Act 2. And I had to get a little creative to beat the last fight of this video because I needed to protect an ally who insisted on getting hit by opportunity attacks as often as possible. It was kind of a nightmare. I went to Withers and had him revive my dead party members and then I stole all of the money back from him because he doesn't care if you pickpocket him so I'll keep the money I can use it better than you can. I headed into an area that was going to be bitterly difficult for a party of my level. And back at camp, Aelin gave me a new spear that is going to let me cast Moonbeam, which is amazing. I have another high level spell in my arsenal. But my party members were attacked in camp while we were trying to rest. And there was a portal that I needed to get to in order to survive. So I just had Lazelle run there in one turn. Um, so that's done, we're, we're out of camp. And we need to go help the dream visitor that we've been having. So I sneak around all the fights because it looks like they will maybe be difficult and cost resources and I don't want to spend any so I headed over and I decided to have Shadowheart and Astarian go into the fight alone. Shadowheart opened by giving two extra AC to the Emperor so he's harder to hit and Astarian used haste to give him an extra action point each turn before I had them run away and go into sneak mode. Well, Shadowheart went into sneak mode. Astarian was actually out of action points. So what I did is I had my wizard throw an invisibility potion at him so that he would be safe and not die so that haste would stay on the emperor. And him having an extra action point is kind of a game changer because he is really, he tries to do everything that he can to die, which is frustrating. I managed to get Tasha's hideous laughter to hit on the boss enemy, um, but they, they get out of it the very next turn. The Emperor uses his first action to stun one of the enemies and the second one to extract their brain, which is kind of the game changer for this fight, because honestly, he would have died to the two of those enemies. He almost dies to the one that's left. Meanwhile, my party needs to take care of the boss lady and one extra Githyanki, which is nasty because we're getting absolutely dumpstered in one hit by them. I used Healing Word to get Lazelle back on her feet, and luckily for me, I still had a bonus action with a very high chance of success and shoved the boss lady into the void. I hope she didn't have good loot, but that was really the best case scenario for me. I also had Lazelle go up onto high ground and keep chucking her spear down because I needed as much damage as possible on these attacks. And thankfully, I was able to take out the two enemies that I was responsible for killing. The spear throw just barely missed it, but my bonus action hand crossbow did the last point of damage. Meanwhile, the mind flayer almost lost his fight to just the, the one enemy me. He's like almost dead, but he decides to come out with a massive chain lightning at the end. I don't know why he's been saving it for so long, but I finally managed to beat Act 2. I agreed to let the Emperor transform my wizard into an Illithid hybrid so I can get access to better powers with my tadpoles. And then I went to Withers and revived Astarian. I'm trying to beat Baldur's Gate 3's hardest difficulty without leveling up any of my party members. And I took on the hardest challenges in Act 3, including trying to save every single Gondian in the Iron Throne, slaughtering Gortash and Orin without them standing a chance, and killing Raphael in an epic battle that I didn't see Coming. My level one party was my first time playing through Act 2, and I had a lot of fun with it, but I tried to proceed into Act 3 blind and honestly felt overwhelmed. So I took some time to play through Act 3 normally. Now that I know the map layout and challenges I'm up against, I'm ready to give it my best shot. I'm committed to posting this video whether I succeed or fail. Right at the beginning of Act 3, I have two goals. First, I want to kill the guards blocking my path towards Baldur's Gate because it pisses me off that the guard robs me of 200 gold. Second, Second, I need to visit the circus and pick up a new throwing spear for Lazelle. So I was actually going to save this strategy for if I got stuck or I needed to go nuclear on a fight, but let's just say I'm feeling overconfident. So I decided to use all of the boxes that I've been picking up and make a giant tower on a roof. 
Then I went and attacked the guards that were trying to steal 200 gold from me, and I lured them over by the tower so that I could have Lazel chuck javelins off the top, doing massive bludgeoning damage because of how high it was being thrown from. While Lazel was throwing spears, I had my wizard protected by the sanctuary spell and was just moving the moonbeam around, which doesn't break sanctuary for some reason. So I was able to just do a massive amount of damage while being pretty much inaccessible to the enemy the entire fight. It still took quite a bit of time to actually finish off the last Steel Watcher because these things are beefy. But we did finish it off and headed towards the circus. And I guess when I grouped my party back up, Lazel decided to try to jump down from the tower instead of climb down. So she took a bunch of damage, but it's okay. She'll be fine. Short rest it off. There's only one thing that I'm here at the circus to get. And in order to get it, I need to get the jackpot when spinning this wheel. To get the jackpot, I need to buy or steal the the ring that Akabi, Akabi, this guy has, and that way he can't use Mage Hand to make sure that I lose when I spin the wheel. Enjoy the jackpot, Muley card. Well, he's a real sore loser about it and teleports me to a jungle full of raptors. And since it's just Lazel here by herself and I don't need experience, there's no reason for me to try to fight them. So I just went into sneak mode and used turn-based mode to try and sneak past all of them. I did almost get caught by one of them, but I flipped the game into turn-based mode just soon enough for me to jump down, grab the jackpot, bring it back to right in front of this guy and open it in front of him. The spear that you get in this jackpot box is amazing. It does a ton of damage and it it comes back to you after throne, so I gave it to Lazelle for her throwing build. Then I went scavenging for Mind Flayer Parasite specimens, and I picked a fight that would normally be easy just to show how outmatched I am at this point. <laughs> Astarian just got one shot by a spell that literally can't miss. That's how much the odds are stacked against me if I fight fair. But come on, who do you think I am? Do you really think I'm gonna fight fair? Absolutely not. And I actually put a lot of effort into trying to make sure that I took on fights in different ways so that you wouldn't just see me use the same strategy over and over and over again. Because, you know, let's have some fun with it, right? This game has so much freedom to play how you want, and I'm particularly proud of the fight against Raphael that comes up later in the video. Because I fight that one, like, almost fair-ish. Kinda. With all that said, let's get into my first big game changer, which is the Displacer Beast shape. This lets me turn my party members into Displacer Beasts, and I went ahead and got Black Hole as well because it's just amazing. Before I can actually turn my party members into Displacer Beasts, I need to convince them to let me use Mind Flayer Parasites on them. So I went and talked to this courtesan here, and the person she was with turns into a Mind Flayer. So we have to take it out, which again, shouldn't really be that difficult, and it, it wasn't like it was a massive challenge or anything, but I have to use like multiple high level spells, all of my party members turns, and I still can't take down one thing. It's a miracle that I got the saving throw against that spell, but I did, so we came out of it unscathed. The reason that I needed to come save this courtesan is that she gives me the rapture buff. Rapture. Yeah, that, that's what I said. Rapture adds 1d6 to basically every check in the game. Attack rolls, ability checks, saving throws, all in until the next long rest, and I'm going to be using it for a lot of ability checks coming up soon. I buffed my character as much as I could to be able to persuade my party members, and one by one, I went through and convinced every single one of them that they should let me use Mind Flayer Parasites on them. And it was pretty easy, actually, because, I mean, like, I need a 15 on Shadowheart, and I rolled a 35. Because between Guidance, Bardic Inspiration, Rapture, the voice of the whatever, I just have so many buffs that I can stack on. So. I turned all of my party members into black hole using displacer beast shifting monsters and we are all ugly now, but it's for the greater good, which is me beating this game at level one. The Displacer Beast is great because it gets to attack three times per turn. It has 85 health and it has multiple abilities that can make really good use of both its bonus action and its regular action if it's too far away from the combat. I'd say their best strength is in absolutely overwhelming the last couple of enemies in a fight because they can make so many illusory copies that it's just really hard for anything to fight against us. But if I were to use them immediately 
immediately at the beginning of every fight, it probably wouldn't be too hard for enemies to take us down and knock us out of this form. And I can only use it once per day. But these enemies down at the docks were the perfect guinea pigs for me to test what the Displacer Beasts could do and figure out when the right time to use them would be. They also make all the NPCs in town freak out, which is equal parts funny and annoying. I tried to talk my way past the guards at the gate so I could get further into the city, but I've already used like all of my best persuasion things, my bardic inspiration, my circle of the whatever thing. So I was even with a 19, I only was able to get up to a 28. But apparently that doesn't matter because you can just fly through solid wood and move right along. So that's what I did. So I cruised on through and I was on my way to the lower city. When I transition from the worm rock area to the lower city, it actually resets the cooldown on my displacer beast, which I didn't really end up using that much. It resets all the cooldowns that you have. So I used it a couple of times, but I didn't really need to use it that often. I have a lot of camp supplies, so I can just long rest when I need to. I headed over to the magic shop to buy some high level scrolls, but it turns out that all of the scrolls are scaled to your level. So I need to go and raid the magic vaults in order to get some actual high level magic. All you really need is a scroll of sea invisibility so that you can see the invisible bits that are left there and it's it's pretty easy to get through. Lazelle got cursed by one of the magic books, but when you remove the curse, it gives you a buff that adds plus 20 temporary health at the beginning of every day, which for me is great. So I got a bunch of really high level magic that maybe I'll even remember to use during this playthrough. To get even more scrolls and gear, I used Fog Cloud in the middle of the magic shop and just robbed Laroican's projection of anything that I wanted, absolutely anything. It was super easy. I moved my pickpocketing gear over to my wizard so that I would have the extra 1d6 from Rapture. and just use a lot of the same old tricks that I've been using for the rest of this series. Then I went and got even more high level magic scrolls by doing some bank robbery. When I put together the rough draft for this video, I put way too many clips of me just opening vaults. Here's all you need to know. I have advantage on every check. I have a bunch of dexterity, proficiency in sleight of hand. I have plus 1d6. I have guidance 1d4. I went and bought more lock picks at one point because I ran out because some of the locks were being stingy and I kept failing. But I opened every single vault and took everything that there was to steal. I also just spammed displacer beasts on the fight in the main vault area and we're gonna move right past this section so I can keep this video moving along. This is the end of the stealing portion of the video, I promise. I just had to use the rapture buff all in one go so that I could steal everything because otherwise I couldn't meet the checks. But I nabbed Laroakin's magic items as well. Also, let me take a second to talk about this improved bardic inspiration that's giving me 1d12. I don't know where it came from. It's just there. And if it's there, I'm going to use it. If you know where it came from, please tell me because I literally have no idea why I have it. Obviously, Obviously Astarian is level 1, he has 9 HP, but here we are. I found a scroll of Globe of Invulnerability, which pretty much gives me a get out of jail free card if I ever get into a fight that has too much damage coming my way that I can't avoid. Then I shuffled a bunch of gear around on my party members, it's mostly not that important. Uh, the big thing that you need to know is that this staff that I got, Marco Heshgear, has Koreska's Favor and it gives me multiple high level spells every day, it gets a reset on short rest, it's a game changer, so I gave Astarian as high of a spell save DC as possible, and he is going to be my main caster for high level spells. Laroakan wants to hurt Dame Aelin, and I didn't think Shadowheart would be cool with that, so... I had my cat lure him over onto the balcony because he's actually a pretty difficult fight and I might have had some trouble with him. So I wanted to see if I could throw him off the edge, but I wasn't getting a clear line to throw him to anywhere. So I tried throwing some boxes down to give myself something to stand on and have maybe a little bit of a higher place to throw off of. That actually seemed like it was going to work pretty well. I was um, up on a higher surface and it looked like that's where it would let me throw from, but I didn't have anywhere to throw to, so I needed to to find something to target. So I just walked around and found a couple of barrels and then made a short stack of barrels, three high, and then picked up Laroakin and yeeted him onto the barrels. And the game told me that he was going to die if I threw him far enough over to the ledge. So I just threw him to there and that that was it. He, the fight's over, he's he's dead, um, Aelin's fine. You can see his, his little body down there floating um, and 
you know, that's rough because I can't get the loot. Or can I? I had a Starion come over and I just used Telekinesis to rip his body back up here so I could loot it. He didn't even have anything good, but it was still good to know that I can pull people's bodies up if I push them off of somewhere as long as the body's in range of Telekinesis. I didn't even have to fight Laroican's elementals. They didn't even aggro. He just died. He just, I threw him off the edge. He, I guess he's a wizard who doesn't know Featherfall and he's dead. I've gotten everything I needed out of the Rapture buff, so I was finally ready ready to take a long rest. The next day, we headed off towards Cazador's place. I put a pretty heavy emphasis on Lazelle in Act 1, Shadowheart in Act 2, so we're gonna make sure we give Astarian what he wants in Act 3. I found a corpse that was oozing with necrotic magic, and I decided that I was going to pick that up to use it for later. It dealt quite a bit of damage to me and was difficult to get positioned where I wanted it, but I did manage to get it moved back into the Worm Rock Fortress area so that it'll be available when I need it. There were a bunch of wolves and rats and stuff that were guarding Cazador's mansion, uh, so I just lured them out of the room they were in and just did a bunch of hit and runs on them while they went down the stairs, and it was almost flawless. I almost took out every single one of them without taking a hit, but right at the end, I failed a couple of attacks and had the enemy just at 1 HP and couldn't finish them off, and so Lazel got dropped. So close to being perfect. Can't win them all though. I found one more scroll of Globe of Invulnerability before going to take on Cazador. Now we are heavily outnumbered and outmatched in this fight and we have a time limit. We have to take Cazador down before he can finish the ritual or else he's going to ascend. It's going to be difficult to find a way to take him down fast enough so that I don't lose this combat encounter and, and let down Astarian. So, oh, oh no, oh, where is he? Oh no, oh, he, and he's dead. Oh, shoot. Poor little guy. Right off the edge. Maybe he should have built this place a little better if he can't survive falls. <laughs> For the rest of the everybody, I just used Black Hole. I used Plant Growth. I blasted them with Area of Effect damage. I threw Lazel's Thunder Spear, which does thunder damage in an Area of Effect around the target that she hits. And they really just couldn't get to us at all. Shadowheart used Sunbeam to do a bunch of damage. I had Astarian use Ice Storm, which he's getting from Koreska's favorite and I also had Astarian fly closer and use Cone of Cold, which he is also getting from Koreska's favor, while Lazel just kept throwing Thunder Spears. And my wizard just kept spamming Black Hole. The plant growth spell quarters their movement speed, so they have almost no chance of getting to us, especially when they get slowed by Black Hole. But the fight was really easy. I didn't take a single hit during it, and I took out all of these enemies so we can go and finish off Cazador now. And this guy was particularly dramatic about laying on the ground. I don't know what his deal is, but, um, you know, he's just having a bad day. With that taken care of, we went ahead and finished off Cazador and let Astarian ascend. Lazelle and Shadowheart let me know how disapproving they were of the situation, but come on, you both had your own act. Let Astarian get some in as well. Having Astarian ascended is going to be a pretty big deal. He gets an extra 1d10 necrotic damage on every attack, and he gets the ascended bite ability, which does a lot of damage. I think it's 66. And on our way out of Cazador's dungeon, we were stopped, and it gave ascended Astarian a chance to see what he could do. I buffed Astarian with Shadowheart and I gave him Haste and Sanctuary so that he'd get an extra action and so that he could make sure he doesn't die in the first round of combat. And then I sent him in alone. They were of course here to kill me and they were willing to cheat to do it. I'm really bitter about this one because the fight setup was perfect. I started with a black hole and pulled everybody together and then I used Cloud Kill, which I'm getting from Koreska's favor. And it did a massive amount of damage, but once it got uh, one of these enemies down below 60% health, they have an ability that's supposed to trigger when they get hit by a melee attack, and they're supposed to return damage. But apparently the game was treating everything as a melee attack, and it downed a Starion, which I just thought was dumb. So I restarted the fight, and I used a scroll of disintegrate on Caitlyn to make sure that she was out of the fight. It returned damage even on that, so it's, it's super bugged. But now I finally get to try out the fight as I was planning to, which is to spam Black Hole and Cloud Kill while using my mobility to fly away. And my strategy worked perfectly. Astarian butchered every single one of them all by himself without taking any damage. I even had him go up and use his new Ascended Vampire Bite to finish off the last one. <laughs> oh, 
that was very, very satisfying. But the game wasn't done trolling me yet, and I was absolutely willing to save scum the crap out of this guy because he just magically breaks out of anything that you crowd control him with, and you have to chase him all around town to try and kill him. And I want his boots. And it doesn't matter if you succeed on the spell cast, he just uses it, he just gets out magically. He just it doesn't he doesn't even have to succeed on a saving throw. He's just out of whatever you put him in. And that pissed me off. So I became determined to kill him without him getting away. I used a scroll of blindness on him so that I could start the fight without him being able to see the fight so he wasn't in it initially and then when the blindness wore off it put him in but after me so I got to go first even though his initiative is way faster than me almost every time then I save scummed until I succeeded on a scroll of hold monster so that all of my hits against him could be critical hits I had one of my characters uh, as a displacer beast I mean they're all displacer beasts right now but I had one of them use a potion of invisibility and sneak up on Delore and then use the displace ability to bring him up to the roof and then I smacked the absolute crap out of him with my other ones getting critical hits. Uh, I did need to use another scroll of disintegrate to make sure that I finished him off but I just I didn't want to deal with it. I didn't I don't I didn't want to trace him around town. I, I just I refuse but it was worth it. I got my dimension door casting boots and those are going to come in handy later and then I just spammed illusory copies for the rest of the fight to finish off the other ones which took actually kind of a long long time, but we did it. I came across Volo about to get exploded, so I went ahead and took all the smoke powder barrels and got him free before going down for another long rest. Today we're headed down to the Iron Throne to try and save the Gondians that are being held captive down there. So we took a nice little ride in a submersible, but when we get there, Gortash decides to blow the whole facility and we only have five turns to try and save as many Gondians as possible. I used Sanctuary on my wizard and then I used haste on Lazel. Lazel followed the hallway south. In one turn, she managed to get all the Gondians on their feet and ready to run before flying back to the door to be ready to close it when they're in. My wizard followed the hallway west, and with Sanctuary on, I didn't need to worry about getting attacked, so I just went ahead and brought the enemies into the fight and went right past them. Astarian did some fighting right at the bottom of the ladder, and Shadowheart finished the job. Running past the enemies that were to the west ended up being a great decision because they ran into a hallway where there's just a bunch of oil barrels already sitting right there. And we managed to clear the south in one turn so that I could shut the door, sealing off the reinforcements that were on their way. Shadowheart flew to the west and set up all the oil barrels so that I could blow up the two slimy fish monsters that were in there. I managed to get just far enough away so that they died and I didn't get touched. And the explosion closed the doors, but I, you can just open them again if you're inside there, so it was very, very simple to clear the west side of enemies. Customer service is very important to my party, so we threw a bunch of water down on the fire so that we could clear the path so that there weren't going to be any Gondians screaming on fire as they got into our submersible. Gotta get those five-star reviews. With the south taken care of, Lazel headed to the east hallway. With haste, I, she has so much movement right now, so I just flew her all the way in and hit those levers so that I could get the Gondians free and they would start running. I figured I could deal with the slimy fish people on the way. And I did! I used Zephyr Flash to do a bunch of damage to the two of them, and all of the Gondians are free of their cages now and running like crazy trying to get to the submersible. I finally finished off the last fish champion, and we did a little bit to help the Gondians the rest of the way to the submersible. I don't think it was necessary but I used Dimension Door to teleport one of them closer. I gave another one Long Strider. With the reinforcements to the south sealed off, all they could do was bang on the door. And my level one party saved every Gondian in the Iron Throne. You saved us! Saved us all! I might have saved all the Gondians, but I unfortunately wasn't able to save everybody on this adventure because in Act 2, Jahira died. So unfortunately, there seemed to be nothing I could do for Minsk. I did try. I tried to take out the doppelganger Jahira first, and maybe I was thinking like, oh, what if he sees the doppelganger? Maybe he'll snap out of it. And that didn't do anything. And then I did a non-lethal blow to knock him out and was like, well, maybe if he gets his head wrung a little bit, he'll snap out of it. But no, there's there was nothing I could do. <laughs> Oh, 
By this point in this video series, you should know I'm not the kind of person to get obsessed with completing some sort of weird, very difficult goal. You know, that's just not me. I definitely am not going to get it in my head that I want to save every single Gondian in the entire Steel Foundry, and I'm willing to waste any number of resources to do that. That's, you know, that's just not the kind of guy I am. But, you know, this first fight is pretty easy, so it, it did turn out that I saved all the Gondians here, but I'm sure I'm going to take it easy later on, and, and, you know, maybe some of them will die. Okay, so what I've done is I've grouped up all of the enemies down here with Black Hole. I blinded them with Hunger of Hadar. Then I got a bunch of explosives from my camp and stacked them all around these guys. And now I'm going to use two scrolls of Dimension Door to evacuate these Gondians to safety. With the Gondian safe, I'm free to set off the explosives and try to one-shot as many of these assholes as I possibly can. But I can't stop there because there's a second group. So Lazelle is going to fly up to the piping, use Black Hole, and then drop even more explosive barrels so we can take this other group out as well. Now, because the Gondians are suicidal maniacs and they are misty stepping into their deaths, I did need to get a little bit of tough love in and yeet some of them across the room with telekinesis for their own good. But it got them far enough away and I was able to transform some of my party members into displacer beasts and start teleporting these steel watchers further and further away until finally we were able to blow them both up without any Gondians nearby, saving everybody in the factory. Huh? Okay, fine. Almost everybody. I went down for another long rest before we go into the heart of the Steel Foundry to take on the boss. And Orin has taken Gale prisoner, but, um... I'm not really using Gale, so I don't know. I'll get there when I get there. I only have one more Gondian that I need to protect, and it's Xander Tubin here, and he's smart enough to say I probably shouldn't be a part of the battle, so I appreciate that. I would be crushed in an instant. I grabbed some steel crates from around the steel foundry, and I put them in front of the doorway, hoping that that was going to be enough to block the steel watchers and the big scary boss thing from getting to me. It did seem to be working quite well. They weren't opening the door, and they were just standing right at my barricade, so I was able to open up the door, fire off some spells, and shut it again before they all wasted their turns. But unfortunately, Xanar Tubin got brought into the fight, so the only way for me to protect him was to box him in with chests, hoping that he wouldn't move. And that also seemed to be working. Well, all of that changed when the Steel Watchers were ready to detonate themselves. I tried to use a black hole to see if I could pull them away from my wall, but they did not get pulled. Hold. And when they exploded, they took the entire barricade with them. Now here's the deal. Could I have gone out, grabbed more chests, and blocked the door with them? Absolutely. I have an insane number of chests just sitting in my base because I've collected just almost anything that I could possibly find. But I kind of just liked the story of this fight. We know we're coming up against a powerful enemy, so we barricade the door and we use it to our advantage only to have that barricade completely destroyed, leaving us with no choice but to do a mad scramble to try to survive. I don't know, it just seemed like a fun fight concept to me. I like the way it went, so that's what we're doing. Also, just make a mental note of the fact that I missed my cast on Witchbolt here, because that's going to matter in a little bit. For a while though, he wasn't opening the door, and I was like, okay, when, like, when's this When's this gonna happen? When's he gonna open the door and, and finally start this thing off for real? And I was able to get some more hits in before he finally did it. He opened the door and targeted the entire area for destruction. Well, if I want to save all the Gondians, then I'm gonna have to do something about this guy who's jumping directly into the middle of the targeted fire. So here's a montage of me missing all of my Witch Bolt casts and yeeting this guy around the room with telekinesis.
Man, Shadowheart is having a rough day trying to save these Gondians because she looks like this now. But hey, I got a really good bow out of it that has Celestial Haste on it, which allows me to haste for five turns without any downside happening at the end. And the Steel Foundry has been destroyed. I had a quest in my journal that was telling me to return to the guild hall so that I could help them defend against an attack from the Zentarim. And I've got to say, I have never felt more unneeded in any fight in Baldur's Gate 3. They were going to win this one without me. It doesn't even seem like it was going to be close. This fight can't possibly be balanced well. But hey, that just means I didn't have to waste any resources and I get to move right along. You'll have what guild blades I can give when the time to take the absolute comes. Time to take on Gortash, but when I went to go grab my backpack that was supposed to be dealing necrotic damage, it didn't seem to be working. So I had to take Victoria's corpse out of it, which was painful immediately and completely. And then I uh, threw a health potion at Lazelle to get her back on her feet and stuffed the body back in the backpack so that I could move it more easily. Once I stepped clear of the backpack, the rest was going to be up to Connor my little zombie friend. Now, when I originally discovered this, I was actually just planning on using the body as one part of an area of effect damage denial system. I was going to try and funnel enemies towards the body and just use it to add extra damage. But that's when I learned that I can just move the backpack slightly away from an NPC and then closer again, and it just does damage over and over again, and you can just do infinite damage with this. So I have a backpack that creates infinite damage and I have a wand that can summon a zombie an infinite number of times to move that backpack. So I just had Connor work his way through the fort, just moving this backpack little by little back and forth, just killing everything all by himself without the need for any help whatsoever. Once it was time to go after Gortash, I had to pick up the backpack again and I sent it over to my wizard who I turned into a displacer beast so they would actually have enough health to not get instantly killed by it. And I was coming in the back door to go after Gortash and something even more fun happened, which is that they didn't get put into to combat with me when I moved the backpack near them. I just had the game in turn-based mode and moved the backpack over and over again and nobody seemed to care. So I was able to clear out one side and then I went over to the other side, but it did put me into combat and I think it's because the guard was looking right at me. So I went back to a previous save because I wanted to test it and I was right. When I cast Fog Cloud so they couldn't see me, I wasn't put into combat and I was able to kill Gortash without ever even being in combat with him. After I'd done this myself, I saw a YouTube video where somebody pointed out that you can do the same thing with Gale's body because I guess when he dies he has a necrotic aura around him. So you can put Gale's body into a backpack and do this to people at any point during the game. Um, just infinite damage for moving something back and forth a little bit. Everybody who played Divinity just has one word on their minds right now. It's the forbidden technique. Barrelmancy. But I don't want this video to just be a Barrelmancy video, so I'm going to leave my backpack behind and continue the rest of the game finding other methods to clear the fights out. I went for a long rest and Orin left me a message congratulating me for killing Gortash. I went into the prison and I freed Counselor Florik so I would have even more reinforcements when we take the fight to the Absolute. Then I figured while I was here I might as well take on Ansur. There's a bunch of puzzles you have to complete to get to Ansur, but I'm just gonna skip past those and get straight to the fight. As ridiculous as this might sound, the only enemy I actually have in this fight are the two elementals that accompany Ansur. This is because of two items. The first is the Helm of the Baldurin. It heals you for two hit points at the beginning of every turn which means that if you're downed, it'll get you back on your feet. Astarian has a ring that has the exact same effect. It heals him 1d4 at the beginning of each of his turns. He did me a solid and took out the first elemental for me, and I used telekinesis to throw the other one in a chasm. And from this point on, my characters are immortal. Unfortunately, Ansur kept on dying in weird little glitches where he would just glitch himself under the floor and perish in a chasm. Uh, so I ended up quick saving a lot during this fight so that I could actually finish the fight instead of have him just kill himself somehow. But really, here's all that happened during the fight. Ansur 
attacks once per turn. So it would attack and down one of my characters. On their turn, their item heals them and gets them back on their feet. The character that didn't get downed just takes a shot at Ansu and does a little bit of damage. Now just repeat that for about an hour, maybe an hour and a half, and the fight is over. It's a little ironic that the item you need to win this fight with a level one character is literally just sitting just a couple feet away from Ansur, but that's really all it takes. Big thanks to the person in my Discord who let me know about this strategy because it was so easy. What have you done? Sad day. I headed over to take on the murder tribunal because I need to defeat them before I'm able to get to Orin. I managed to talk my way through the first part of the murder tribunal and convince them that I am in fact a murderer and, and did all the murdering, so much of the murdering. And this is a lot more convenient for me because it makes sure that every enemy in this fight is going to be at the end of a very narrow hallway. Love that. So I went ahead and picked a fight while under the protection of Sanctuary. Then I went ahead and had my party members layer a ton of damaging spells in the doorway. I had two Cloud of Daggers, one Hunger of Hadar, and one Avard's Black Tentacles. I moved all my party members up to the second floor and then just watched as all of these enemies tried to work their way towards me. Now I wasn't actually expecting Saravok to be able to just run through all of that and come all the way upstairs, but it's okay. I just used Black Hole to yank him back down and another Black Hole to pull him into the hallway again. I added plant growth to the mix to make sure it would be even harder for him to walk through. Then I just waited and watched while everybody tried to approach and was taking massive amounts of damage on their way to me. And I had Lazelle throw in some Thunder Spears to add even more damage. Eventually, I took down all of Saravok's reinforcements, but he was going to be much harder to defeat now than I was expecting. Saravok is permanently hasted. He has an armor class of 28 and still has a lot of health left, 165. On his first approach, he completely killed my wizard all in one go. Just hacked me to pieces. So I had my party members scatter, and I brought a backup plan. There was a wheelbarrow right at the beginning of this area, and I brought it with me so I could block the doorway. It didn't do much, but at least it forced him to use his bonus action to jump over it instead of to do anything else. Then I flew all my party members back past him up to the second floor, and this time I think the wheelbarrow came in clutch, because I cast you Hunger of Hadar again on top of him, and for some reason, he just decided to stand in it. He stood in it, taking damage every single turn until finally he went down and was dead. Luckily for me, there's always a way to cheese a fight. There's really only one more mandatory fight in this playthrough that I would have to do in order to beat the game, and that's against Orin because I need her Netherstone. Now, it might have been a mistake to have Astarian lead the conversation because I kind of just got in the mind mindset and answered that Gale didn't really matter to me, so... That didn't go particularly well. But it was the truth. Gale has been of no significance for this run, and I don't need him to finish the game. Then Orin went into Slayer form, turning into a giant, disgusting monster. And the challenge here is that she has Unstoppable 10. This reduces the damage she takes from 10 different attacks, and while she's unstoppable, I can't move her with any of my abilities. What could my level 1 party possibly do to be able to deal with a massive monster that we can barely damage and can't move. Well, the first nine unstoppable stacks went away to Magic Missile, the tenth went away to Astarian's Ascendant Bite, and a Shadow Heart Black Hole, followed by a Force Tunnel from Astarian, and the fight is over. Okay, not quite over, I still had to finish off Orin's troops, but that really wasn't any trouble. Now, although Orin was the last mandatory fight I needed to take on, I just don't think this run would be complete if I didn't fight Raphael, because honestly, it's probably a harder fight than all of the endgame stuff that's going to come after him. Does Baldur's Gate 3's final boss have some quirks I'm going to need to overcome? Yes, absolutely. But in terms of raw combat power, Raphael's got that fight beat. I hadn't found any clues telling me that Helsic could open a portal for me, so I headed over to the House of Grief so that I could read something that would allow me to have the conversation with Helsic asking her to open a portal for me. I got what I needed and figured while I was there, I might as well do the House of Grief fight. This 
This fight went extremely smoothly, with me just spamming plant growth, black hole, area of effect spells, and blasting the crap out of everybody, except for one little hiccup where my entire party got insta-killed. Big oops moment there, I had never done this fight before, so I didn't know that she could use divine intervention and nuke all of us through the door. Lesson learned, I did the fight again, and it was very easy, I just made sure that my party members were spread out enough, and I had some of my party members go Displacer Beast towards the end, which ended up making the cutscene kind of funny. Is there supposed to be a blade? With that out of the way, I opened a portal to hell and headed to the House of Hope to try and take on Raphael. I decided to try something that was a pretty weird and potentially bad idea. I could have seen this going really poorly. I decided to throw my spectator in a flask at the jailers that are holding Hope prisoner. And I didn't know if it would just join their team or if it would be hostile to them, but it was totally hostile to them, which was amazing because I managed to have the spectator waste all of the turns of all the imps and enter combat right towards the end of the round so that I could have much more favorable battle conditions. Then I just blasted everything with all the high level magic that I can because you can restore all of your health and spell slots while inside the House of Hope at the Restoration Fountains, so there was no reason to hold back. Then I headed off to fight Raphael's sex toy, which looks exactly like him and has all the same letters of his name. I guess self-love is important, so good job, Raphael. And by keeping his incubus slowed with the effects of Black Hole constantly, it didn't have any reactions to use, so it couldn't use the innate ability it has to slip away every time that it takes damage, which made the fight much easier for me to get through. Something pretty weird did happen to Lazelle, which is that she got bugged. Uh, she received the Incubus Kiss, and the game thought she only had one max health, and the debuff wouldn't wear off. The game knew that she had more health than that. She stepped in the Moonbeam and took damage from it, and then the game said that she was dead, but she was alive at the same time. I don't really know what the deal was. I ended up killing her later and then reviving her so that I could get her reset to normal. I stole Raphael's Orphic Hammer, then I needed to deal with all of the people in his house freaking out, so I used Telekinesis to throw one Hell Sphere off the edge, and I just attacked another one and it just didn't get mad, so I, I just kept attacking it until it was gone. But eventually I'd cleared the entire House of Hope and I was ready to go and fight Raphael. I actually tried a couple of weird tactics that didn't end up working. The first was that I covered the floor in the House of Hope with water, like a really large amount of water, and I tried electrocuting Raphael and everybody in there. And I think it honestly would have worked if I had just kept going, but it was gonna take such a long time and it seemed seemed so boring and like such a sad way to win the fight. I, I just didn't like it. So I tried throwing him off the edge, which I didn't think would work because they've got wings and a lot of things with wings don't get thrown off edges. And that was true. They it didn't work. It, they popped right back up. I eventually decided that it would be a lot more epic if I actually had some fighting happen rather than just instantly winning with some sort of gimmick. I pre-buffed all of my characters with Sanctuary and then ran them over to the fight room while it was in turn-based mode so I could make sure there was still some time left on my Sanctuary casts. And there's a couple of important things that you need to know about this fight in order to understand what you're about to watch. One. I'm using Fog Cloud to block enemies' vision, but it doesn't block vision of people that have Devil Sight, which includes Raphael and your gear. Two, I'm using the Illithid Power Mind Sanctuary so that my party members can use actions and bonus actions for anything. This allows me to use their bonus actions to hide in the Fog Cloud. Three, Shadow Heart's Mace blinds fiends, so I have her standing out away from the party to try to blind the enemies that have Devil Sight so they can't see into the fog cloud, because that would reveal my characters out of stealth if we fail the check. My priority is to try and take out your gear first, while also taking down as many cambions as possible. If I do get spotted during the fight, my party members are going to have no choice but to run like hell, because we will be completely outmatched. Since your gear turns invisible pretty much at the end of every one of his turns, I'm blindly firing things at his location to try to get a hit and reveal him so I can keep taking him down. With all that said, I hope you enjoy what I did with the fight.
effects in the course. Curtain falls, but hold your applause. Squirm, squirm, for now down here come the claws. Hope, we got your back. Astarian downed himself by taking down the Cambion that was threatening her, and Shadowheart got him back on his feet and gave him sanctuary so he'd be safe until his next turn before she flew up to the balcony where she would be safe. I had summoned a spiritual weapon in the room and they just left it behind, so I started taking down pillars with it, and I started running hit and run attacks by flying my characters down off the balconies, dealing some damage, and flying them back up, and also by throwing smoke powder bombs off of the balconies to try and kill some of the Cambions. Since Astarian had Sanctuary on him, I brought him back into the room with the pillars and had him turn into a Displacer Beast so that he could start working on finishing off the rest of the pillars, because the Spiritual Weapon only had enough turns to take down two of them. Luckily, the bludgeoning damage is doubled against these pillars, so the Displacer Beast was pretty good at taking them down, and it wasn't long until I had all four pillars destroyed. With all the pillars destroyed and all of Raphael's reinforcements depleted, I had all all of my party members go to Splacer Beast and we just started summoning a massive amount of illusory copies all over Raphael, trying to give him anything to hit that wasn't us. That being said, he was pretty good at making sure that he targeted my real characters instead of illusory beasts. But since we had enough of a health pool to actually take the hits without dying, and I had Hope spamming healing spells for us, we were able to overwhelm Raphael. And man, it took such a long time. It He's got such a large health pool, but since he was isolated, we finally took him down. I brought Raphael down to just right on the edge of death, and then I let Hope do the honors and finished him off with a completely excessive divine intervention. I feel like she earned it. I feel like if she was gonna use it at any moment, right now is a good time, just to make sure that he's dead. So, it's finally time. It is finally time to take on my final challenge of this level one playthrough. I decided to release Orpheus rather than and help the Emperor. And rather than turning Orpheus into a Mind Flayer, I had my wizard turn into a Mind Flayer. This is because I wanted to keep Orpheus's abilities intact, and because it's a huge spike of power to have one of my characters get turned into a full-on Illithid. The upgraded Illithid abilities do a ton of damage, and they aren't really necessary because I just summoned every single ally that I had acquired throughout this playthrough all at once and just let them run down the enemies for me, but having the extra power still gives me a little bit of leeway in case anything doesn't go my way. So the first part of the finale is complete. We've gotten through the battleground area. Now we need to get past the ships that are going to be bombarding this area, which is really easy. I just had Lazel fly right past everything while hasted, and that's done. Uh, part two is done. We are officially ready to go up and take on the Netherbrain. For some reason, my Mind Flayer that is supposed to be able to fly decided to climb up 
but that's cool. Uh, you know, maybe save your psychic strength or whatever it is. Up at the top, I just had all of my characters chug potions of invisibility and Orpheus used invisibility on himself. So we were able to just ignore everything because they can't see us. We just turned invisible and scattered and headed towards the crown. The enemies didn't know what to do so much that the dominated red dragon used fire breath on the emperor. So gotta love that. I summoned some allies once I got to the crown of Karsis, but it really wasn't necessary at all. Because I just had Orpheus use globe of invulnerability on my full party so that we were all invulnerable to damage, then I threw a bunch of invisibility potions at the ground and made sure that my entire party was invisible while immune to damage, so nothing would even try to target us. I finished the initial channeling portion of this, so basically getting past the third part of the finale, and this is where it got kind of fun. I can't tell you for sure why this happened, but my assumption is that since my character was invisible upon entering the mind of the netherbrain, it didn't actually bring the mind of the netherbrain into the combat queue. So when I decided to cast Moonbeam on its location, the game treated it as, oh, here's some damage. Normally we would step out of the way and just get out of the damage zone. But since the netherbrain can't move, I was able to kill the netherbrain while completely AFK. It just sat there. It literally just sat there in my Moonbeam. And the Moonbeam is a part of the combat, so the 10 turns that it has aren't running out. But the Netherbrain is not, so it was just taking damage over and over and over again with absolutely nothing that it could do. And honestly, I am thrilled that I found out a way to kill the Netherbrain in a single turn without needing to do anything. I love finding stuff like this, but I didn't think it was the best ending to this video. So once I was done finishing off the Netherbrain with Moonbeam, I went back and I fought again. After all, I've been hoarding high level scrolls for the entire course of the game. It'd be nice to actually use a couple of them, right? So I used all of my summoning scrolls. I summoned a Deva or a Diva or whatever, and I summoned some elementals. I used scroll of globe of invulnerability. I blasted it with this improved magic missile scroll. And with two turns remaining, I finished off the nether brain with a party of only level one characters. I had a ton of fun doing this challenge. I hope you enjoyed watching it. I plan on making a lot of Baldur's Gate videos for a long time, so let me know what other challenges you would like to see me do, and if I don't get to it immediately, I will probably get to it eventually. Maybe. Probably. M most likely. We'll see. Love you, bye!